Hey everybody. You caught Hi me. There. You caught me and my 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 older brother Lee at home doing the thing we normally do, which is we're just constantly number one showered and dressed and talking to each other about the things that interest us most, which is Writing thriller. But, but we can also mention that you and I are always dressed R.L. Stein casual like this in all black. Yes. At all times. At all times. That's, that's the first rule of being a thriller writer. You must dress like R.L. Stein, or you have to wear a leather jacket and lean against a brick wall in an alley. <laughs> Those are the two rules of thriller writing. You know what we, we should do, photos, Lee? That makes it very clear. We we should at some point um, before the uh, this talk goes public, we should provide uh, the folks from the International Thriller Writers Association with photos of our favorite crime writers in their most absurd book jacket poses. <laughs> and maybe they'd let us do a second panel where we mock our friends who are, uh, you know, sitting at home, middle-aged Jewish people like us and not jumping out of planes. Unless yeah. they're <laughs> I just think it's funny, all these authors we know who are like in back alleys with the graffiti, <laughs> wearing a leather jacket they don't own, trying to look tough, you know, with a Doberman or something or in the shadows. But well, that's not why people are tuning in here to learn about how to dress like a thriller writer. <laughs> they want to learn how to write like a thriller writer. Well, I think people, well, there's two reasons people are tuning in. Number one, I don't think they often believe that we're really related because we look so different that <laughs> it, it seems implausible that we're actually brothers. But in fact, we are. Lee is the older one. You can tell. Also because the thinner one. That is not true. We will stand up and we will pirouette. We can't stand up because I'm naked from here down. <laughs> <laughs> then this becomes a porno shoot. <laughs> People really just wanted to see inside of our homes. And as you can tell, both Lee and I have fantastic bookcases. Um, so we thought we would do a talk today that is not dissimilar from a talk we would do if we were on a panel together, which means we'd ignore everybody else and talk to each other about the things that most interest us, again, ourselves. Um, but in particular, the sort of uh, unusual brand of mystery and thrillers that uh, we both write. Not that we write really anything like each other, but there are some, um, for sure, some some through lines that that we share. So let's let's start off, Lee, um, at the beginning because there's no me unless there's you because you were the oh, person. I didn't give birth to you. There was no weird incestuous thing in our family. <laughs> well, but you were you were a big influence on me. So let let's start out uh, just from the the get go. Where did you, like, what, what was the touchstone book that made you want to start writing thrillers? Or was it TV shows? Well, no, I, I, I read it voraciously as a kid. I read all the Hardy Boys and Tom Swift and Nancy Drews. And then I, I moved on to Travis McGee and James Bond and Matt Helm. And I'm just, I devoured books. But I can tell you the moment and the book that made me realize I could do this. Not that I was as good as that particular author. Right. But it was the... It was revelatory, and, and that was Gregory McDonald's Fletch. And if you remember that book, forget the Chevy Chase movie, but the book, the whole story was dialogue-driven. The dialogue right. was so good that the cover of the book was some of the dialogue. And it, it opened my eyes to a whole different kind of writing that was that would actually presage, is that the right word? It is, like well done. <laughs> because... These were stories that were dialogue-driven, where character and story were revealed, for the most part, through what people said, rather than what was going on in their heads or description from, from the author. And then I, I somehow migrated into George V. Higgins and the Friends of Eddie Coyle and Kennedy for the Defense, which are also heavily dialogue-driven. And then the Robert B. Parker Spencer novels, which kind of struck the middle ground between an authorial voice, even though it's first-person um, Spencer, but also still dialogue-driven. And that really shaped my writing. That really mm -hmm. shaped um, the way I thought about telling a story. And then, because I wanted to be in TV, too, television is all dialogue and action-driven. If you don't see it or hear it, it's not happening. Because there is no written description. Well, and so... If, if anyone's ever heard this story, you can just jump forward three minutes. Um, but part of the reason why your influences are important to me is that one of my big influences as a young writer, so Lee is, uh, is nine years older than me. So when Lee went off to college, he left me this huge big bag of paperback books. 
and it was like the first 15 Spencer novels. It was a bunch of old Elmore Leonard books, including the Westerns. It was Donald Westlake. It was all of these, all these great crime writers. And he'd come back from college to visit and he would, um, he would bring Doritos and explicably always brought us Doritos, but uh, he would always bring me another big stack of paperback books to read. So by the time Lee graduated college at 22, I was 13. And I had received in those four years an education in crime fiction. I had read from my young adult novels instead of reading, um, you know, Perks of Being a Wallflower or something, which would come out 25 years later. Um, I was reading Elmore Leonard and, um, and uh, Donald Westlake books and Lawrence Block. What's interesting to me is the authors you're mentioning that I left for you are all authors, and we'll get to this later, who write thrillers with a great deal of humor. A ton. Right. Leonard's funny. Lawrence Block is funny. Donald Westlake is funny. Uh, certainly Fletch was funny. Mm -hmm. There were still dramas. There were still crime, but with a sense of humor. Yeah. And I didn't the leave books... you a lot of Mickey Spillane or... No. <laughs> no. Spillane or, of course, he wasn't around then, but, you know, the darker he... stuff. But then you also got me into reading the Destroyer novels, yeah. the Rima Williams books, which... You know what it was like to be a real man. Well, I mean, they were absolute crap and the best things ever written. And I actually believed for a while that Sinanju was a real place and martial art. Um, but the interesting thing that happened for me when I was reading those books, perhaps different than for you, is that I always gravitated to the hard, uh, the hardcore buddy to the, the moral private eye. I was all about Hawk. You were all about Spencer. Um, I was always interested in the guy who's a little bit off of the law uh, doing bad things, but you are always writing more about the heroes. And I think as our careers have grown in the 16 or 17 books or however many I've written in the 154 that you've written, um, you have always aimed more towards writing heroes, not contempt, not uh, the commonplace hero. And I've always written about a bad guy who's trying to be good. And I, I wonder if that has something to do with reading those books. It may also have been intentionally shaping my voice for mainstream popularity. I knew mm -hmm. I wanted to write widely accepted, uh, widely embraced fiction, and I wanted to write in television where you're trying to please a wide audience. So it's finding a way to tell stories about quirky, unusual characters within a... Again, when I got in the business, it wasn't like it is today where you have The Sopranos and a, a lot more right. hard edge sort of television. It, you know, it was the era of, not to date myself too much, but Cannon and Maddox yeah. and Barney <laughs> right. Jones. And, you know, the edgiest character on TV was Jim Rockford. So times have changed quite a bit and, and hopefully I've adapted with them. But Well, the, and that's interesting because I tend to write anti-heroes and you write, you write actual heroes. Um, and, and it might just be from that period of time. Like, you know, when you were, when you were watching TV as a young, younger person, it was all the Mannixes and the Cannons and all those things. And when I was really coming of age, I was, you know, the, maybe the show that influenced me most as a TV watcher lasted one full season, and that was Stingray. <laughs> so and see, you were influenced by Stingray. For me, it was... Essentially, it's the same show over and over again. You know, Maverick and the Rockford Files. Right. Where you have heroes who are cowards and selfish, but <laughs> find a way to make a living and be heroic despite themselves. Right. And, and of course, I, I gravitated towards, you know, Alexander Mundy and It Takes a Thief and Simon Templer and The Saint and, and James West and Star Trek, who were, uh, Star Trek, excuse me, Wild Wild West, who were, you know, suave, debonair, sure of themselves all the things i wasn't in right now. <laughs> the way i'm rocking this black rl spine shirt <laughs> you know that i i think that's that's an interesting thing that you know the you you've always loved james bond and if you were to pan your camera around people would be able to see the all the, the james bond posters, all the james yeah. bond posters well, I, I could pan a little bit Watch out for the underwear and stuff. But there you go. <laughs> There's so uh, the picture of me. Right. Uh, that's a whole other story. That's that's that might be the most revealing thing. It's all posters of James Bond and, a, and, <laughs> and a, a giant painting of Lee's face. Yeah, it's, a, it's a gift from the state of Kentucky. But again, <laughs> another story. The last the last good thing Kentucky did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's signed but, by Rand Paul. It's really quite. Oh astonishing. God. So you you always had that sort of James Bond thing that you loved, and even your email address now still has 007 in it. Um, 
But, you know, the, the James Bond of the books, of course, is different than the James Bond of the movies. And the James Bond of the books is more like what you do, where it's someone that has got the sort of Daniel Craig complexity that's shown back up. So in why are you attracted movies. to the drug dealer who decides to become a private eye? Yeah, it's a weird thing. I, I think for me, um, you know, I, I like the person who walks into chaos and tries to be the unifying force to get someone out of the chaos, but not someone who's all that good. I like someone who does something that's surprisingly good in the midst of being a, a terrible person. Now, your first few books were very, very, very dark. You've lightened up a bit. But, <laughs> but your books are not traditional whodunits or right. crime stories, police procedurals, nor are they traditional thrillers, except for the one you did with, with Brad Meltzer. Right. Um, and, and then I gave also the Burn Notice books, but those were tie-ins where you were working with a character you didn't create. But, you know, so the, but the, the Burn Notice books are interesting um, for me as a, as a writer. And sort of, so for the, those of you watching, the reason we're talking about these things is that part of what we think is interesting about the, the thriller genre and crime writing in general is that it allows for some of this sort of wild uh, derivation in the form. Lee and I typically write these things that have a, a comic undertone in them. At some point, there's always a joke in in our books and for me when i was deciding that i wanted to start writing sort of commercial crime fiction and the opportunity presented itself for me to write the burn notice books um when i met with matt nix who's my old friend and who created uh burn notice basically i said look if i'm going to write these books i want to i want to do it like if Elmore Leonard was writing tie-in novels. And he said, well, that's great because I write the television show as though I am Elmore Leonard. <laughs> and so it was sort of the perfect relationship for us, but it taught me how to write for the masses um, with humor, but also with action and character, which is the thing that when I was writing more literary fiction earlier in my career is what I really liked best is having a plot that comes directly from a character versus a plot that comes from a bomb that's buried in the center of the earth. I have that same issue whether I'm doing a whodunit or a thriller or a police procedural. I'm not that interested in the case of the week or the case mm -hmm. of the book. And the case, just for lack of a better term, the, the problem that has to be resolved, the hero or the protagonist has to have an emotional investment. Right. And the story, the case, has to exist to reveal the problems and the hangups and the, the obstacles within that, that person. And if it doesn't, then it's not a very good case. So I, I never start with the mystery. I always start with what do I want to explore about this particular character? And the great thing about the thriller or mystery genre is it gives you a narrative engine. It gives you a goal. It gives you stakes to, to hang that story on. So if the character screws up, people will die. There'll be real consequences. I don't think I could write about a family that's being torn apart by infidelity or <laughs> secrets or drug abuse. Or Look, that book was good, and I lost a lot of awards for it. <laughs> I, I, I can't do that. And it's not that I need someone to walk in with a gun, but I like a mystery. I, I like, and the mystery doesn't have to be a murder. It could be all, there's some different variations on a mystery. Or, or just needs to have a, like the, the books I wrote with Jan Ivanovich, they were thrillers, they weren't mysteries, but they were, they were con jobs. Right. We have to, to achieve this goal, we're going to have to steal this object and mount this con, and if we make mistakes, we're going to die, and if we don't succeed, we're going to die or go to prison. Oh, and there's a ticking clock. And that brings out the best and worst in, in your characters. And, and it also gets the importance, which we can talk about later, of, I believe having a tight plot before you even start writing. Mm -hmm. So you're not making it up as you go along and typing and treading water and, and, and filling space as you're looking for your story, looking for your conflict. Well, and I think that's, that's the big thing that has been the change in my writing um, in the last, gosh, I guess, six or seven years since I've been writing uh, a series about um, a rabbi or I'm sorry, a hitman who pretends to be a rabbi in Las Vegas. So my, my Gangsterland book. So I've written uh, three of them. My third one comes out in, uh, in February. And then there'll be a fourth one. And then if everything goes right, there'll be a TV show as well. So that would be nice. Um, but none of the, the, the plot of the books is very simple, which is that 
hitman hiding out as a rabbi can't get caught. <laughs> that's that's the plot. And also has to make a living and and, and has to make a living and, and has and is looking to keep his wife protected and his family protected and trying to figure out a way to get out of this problem that he has. And trying uh, to be somebody else while still being who he is. Right. Being and good enough in conflict. Being that's good exacerbated enough in his, by the things around him. Right. Being good enough in his job that no one suspects him for being anything other than what he is. Um, but in order to write those books, I had to I had to invest myself first and foremost in the character. No one comes up to me to talk to me about these books and says, I love this plot point. Invariably, they like the person first and foremost, Rabbi David Cohen, um, because his conflicts are personal and they beget the plot. His issues cause the story to happen. Um, you know, his self-deception and uh, the long con of being in the mob all require him to do certain things. And I, I think that's an interesting part of where your last, I guess, 10 books have been very successfully um, in your two series, your Eve Ronan series, Lost Tales, which just came out, and your Ian Ludlow series, um, which were, were big bestsellers, in, in that both of those series of books are about a person who is at a crossroads in their life, and then a, a thing happens to them that brings out the best in them. Um, did you always know when you were writing those books that it was going to be about that person and not about the the crime they, well, they solve each or get had themselves different, in? Different evolutions. Um, the Ian Ludlow books actually required me to take a hard look at the thriller genre, right? Because that's where the books came from. I was amused by the fact that you have all these guys who look like you and I who are writing about these super confident, you know, <laughs> action heroes with six packs you. who can. Always say the right thing. Always get the woman in bed. They they save the world every week, and they. But in real life, we're not capable of doing those things. So, what if Lee Child found himself having to be Jack Reacher, or Michael Connelly found himself having to be Harry Bosch? Because, well, there's an anecdote that um, uh, Larry Block told me once. Notice the way I just dropped that name. Yeah, up. that was nice. Are you gonna call Michael Connelly Mike? Yeah, Mikey. Um, <laughs> That Dutch Leonard and I were having drinks. <laughs> but there was some author, we'll call him Ir Irv Pevnik. Um, somebody had broken into Irv Pevnik's house and stolen some stuff from him, and the police weren't helping him out. And, and Irv Pevnik wrote the, the brilliant um, Jack Slade series. So Larry said, well, why don't you just solve it the way Jack Slade would? And Irv Pevnik said, because I'm, I'm not Jack Slade. And, and Lawrence Block said, yes, you are. Every deduction, everything Jack Slade has done, you've done. Now, you haven't, you know, hung from a helicopter with your teeth, but you've done all those other things. You can go approach this like Jack Slade. And Herb Pepper says, no, 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 I can't because I'm not him. But Larry hit on a, or Lar, as I call it. But Larry hit on a very important thing, which is we know how, how our characters think. We are those characters. They are extensions of us. So true fiction was about a guy like me having to, to, survive a situation like he typically write about right. but also confront all the cliches of the thriller genre and how stupid they are but while at the same time <laughs> celebrating them because i wanted to write a really effective thriller but at the same time point out the the machinery that goes into making them right and that's what made the in love of so amusing is that even while you are poking fun at this thing that we all love, he's using those tropes to actually exactly. solve the crime that he is in. So the way the, the key was, here's the trope, here's why we like it, here's why it's effective, and here's how I'm going to subvert it and yet give you the same satisfaction. So it was a, a magic trick in a sense, but it was also me exploring my love of the thriller and deconstructing it for myself. Mm -hmm. now, you mentioned the Eve Ronins. Those books are entirely different and actually reflect decades of experience in writing what I've learned about myself and about the craft of writing. I wanted to write a police procedural, but that ground had been trod so well by Michael Connolly and Joseph Wamba and on television by Law and & Order and Homicide. And, you know, what could I really bring to it that hadn't been done a thousand times before? And I, I thought I had an idea, and I went to a homicide investigators training conference to um, just look for details so it would give me some verisimilitude and help me flesh out the plot I had in mind. And there was a case presented at that Homicide Investigators Training Conference that went against all the 
assumptions and common sense of a homicide investigator. You know, you have what's, when you're a homicide investigator, you have homicide common sense. If X, Y, and Z happens, it's usually this or that. Mm -hmm. And this case was an example of why you've got to approach each homicide as a virgin, as if you've never solved a homicide before, and leave all that common sense aside because it's bullshit. That if you used any of the common sense in this case, you would not have solved it. Right. In a way, that was like the tropes of the thrillers. There's, there's tropes in a real-life homicide investigation that you can get trapped in. And I just that case just inspired this character in me. What if there was someone who doesn't have experience as a homicide detective, who finds herself in the middle of a major homicide case, and she comes at it without the common sense because she doesn't have it. Right. And dealing with that. And then I thought about a different way of writing. Um, I've learned some valuable, valuable lessons writing with Janet Ivanovich. And, and she has taught me the, now you and I have a disagreement about this at times, but I, I believe, she believes that the writer's voice should be absent. That anytime you write something clever, you draw attention to the writing and pull the reader out of the story. They suddenly remember, oh, I'm reading a book. So if, if you're going to say something clever, put it in a character's mouth. You know, don't draw attention to the writing. Don't over-describe. Show the one thing that, that characterizes the situation or the room or the person, and that's it. And so I tried to do that. I tried to write very lean and mm -hmm. to take my voice out of it. And that was so unbelievably hard because you and I think we're so clever. Right. We love to celebrate our own witty cleverness and to actually Look, pull stuff out. See, this is the difference, Lee, is that I, I tend to have a, uh, a fairly in-depth narrative voice, at least in the Gangsterland books, but I'm a job creator because by doing that, I give my editor something <laughs> to do. He gets to chop and chop and chop and chop and chop to find the one good sentence, and that keeps him employed. And so in that way, Lee, I'm good for the American okay. economy. That's the way I view it. You're, you're, but, you're you know, a publisher stimulus package. Yes, I'm a publisher yeah. stimulus package. But you, you bring up an interesting point, you know, the, this, the use of humor, because both of us do it. And we, you know, we write books that have a lot of death and violence in them. Um, you know, in, in my gangster books, you know, the, the body count is typically somewhere in the 25 to 30 range in each book. Um, and the, the main character is, is a murderer. He, he, you know, he's a, a very efficient killer. Um, but people tend to like him because he has an interesting worldview that in my case often comes through in, in the narrative versus in the dialogue because he doesn't reveal himself too much as he talks. Um, but I found that for both of us that we use humor in our, our crime fiction not to turn our books into comic novels, but to sort of hang a lantern over reality. And the reality is that even in bad situations, things are absurd or funny or strange or weird. Have you cut humor from your books? Have you cut a really funny line? Yeah, you know, in, in my new book, there's a short story called uh, Goon Number 4, actually, that will appear in the, the Larry Block anthology, The Darkling Halls of Ivy, which comes out uh, later this month. And when I was uh, in the editing process for the new book, my editor was like, this is, this is a pretty absurd story. And I said, yeah, you know, that was intentional. It's, it's about, so it's about goon number four in the background, his life. And, yeah, uh, and Bill Rabke and I once uh, plotted out a spec script called Thug Number One, all about yeah. the guy in the turtleneck. Yeah, the that first guy. person shot in a, in a you know, right. detective so I, novel. I wrote a short story about goon number four going uh, going to community college. And, um, and so Dan was cutting out a lot of the funny stuff and trying to make it more serious. And I was like, you have to understand that Dan is my editor. I was like, you have to understand that I'm, I'm trying to be absurd and I'm trying to be funny. And he said a very wise thing to me, which is like, it can be that absurd and that funny in that anthology, but it can't be that absurd and that funny in this book. And that was, that was a good sort of lesson. But I think for both of us, we've always used action to reveal character. I remember this is something that you taught me a million years ago when, you were, um, when I was just starting out and you were working more in TV, which was you said, you know, when, when you're writing action, I want you to think about that how someone drives a car reveals their character. And like that was that was one of the best lessons I ever received as as a thriller writer. Like, oh, if I'm gonna have a car chase, 
the way they drive that car in that car chase is going to reveal something elemental about because it. the action itself is boring. A right. car chase, a fight, a shooting, boring. It's how your character's personality is reflected in the actions they take, the choices they make, and the mistakes they make. That's what makes the act, and also what they have at stake in the action. Right. So, and and so I've applied that to I've applied that to car chases, to sex scenes, to yeah, gunfights, well everything. That is the key to me to writing a good sex scene. It's not about describing the bodies or you know. It's about what that sex is expressing about the relationship, about how the characters feel about one another. It's not about turning people on. It's not about porn. Hey, uh, viewers, never read our sex scenes. <laughs> They're terrible. They're horrible. I, I had to learn about sex by reading one of Lee's books when I was a young person. Not, not the Three Minutes of Vigilantes, because those are ridiculous. That's, that's a whole other story. The first sex scene I ever read was written by my brother. Well, that's horrifying. It was horrifying. <laughs> that's really horrifying. Um, the first sex scene I ever read was written by my mom, but that's a whole different <laughs> level of horror. Well, we only have a, a little bit of time left. Um, and so I, I think, you know, is there a unifying principle that, that you have um, when you're writing a book? Is there something that when you say, okay, I'm going to spend the next... So for me, it takes me a year to write a book. I know you can write a book in, in a little bit shorter time. Um, but is there something big that is in your head when you sit down? Yes. What is the conflict for my character? And, and, and how is that conflict going to be reflected in every single scene, every single encounter? Because if those scenes don't reveal character, character or heighten the conflict, I'm going to cut it. Mm -hmm. That's how I keep my books tight. That's how I keep the momentum. It's all about the central conflict. That's what I'm going for. I don't look at theme. I don't look at, you know, this is a cool mystery. I look at what is the conflict that's going to keep me engaged in every conversation I write about and every action scene I describe. Yeah, no one's ever walked into a bookstore and said, hey, do you have a book with a great theme? <laughs> like that, that's never happened. Uh, I have a, a longstanding argument with my friend Mark Sarvis about theme. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to win eventually. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm the same. You know, I don't, I don't think about that, that, that larger, um, emo I, well, I do think about the larger emotional thing. Like, what is, what is this character trying to solve? But my sort of unifying theory of crime fiction, um, the way I write it, at least, is that I, I, I want to show some aspect of society. Um, I want to, I want to explore some small part of the world and, and the inherent nature of the crime within that world. Because I'm so cynical that I believe every <laughs> institution that we have is corrupt in some, in some basic form. And so I want to dig into that. So sometimes it's religion or government or, or Starbucks. You know, it's, it's something at, at all times. I didn't realize until you interviewed me for, I think it was the LA, Time, LA Review of Books a few mm -hmm. years ago, that I have the same theme in almost every one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> which is the conflict between what is expected of us in cliche or television or fiction and the reality we have to live and how we're constantly right. confronted with the higher expectations put on us by something or somebody else. And, and you pointed it out. You said it's in The Walk. It's in Watch Me Die. It's mm -hmm. in, in, in True Fiction. It's in The Reeve Ronins. I went, crap. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like John Irving. I only write about bears and prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's been fine for John Irving. Yeah. <laughs> well, we only have a couple months left. So um, quickly, what, uh, what are you working on now? What, what can readers expect to see from you in the next year if we live through this pandemic? I am actually articulating a problem I'm having right now, which is I'm plotting my third Eve Ronan book and delving into what is the conflict I want to explore and trying to find the right crime story to explore that. And you'd think it would get easier with all the TV shows I've written, all the books I've written, and actually it gets it gets harder. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting uh, here trying to practice what I preach. <laughs> I'm rocking you, this R.L. Stein casual. And you, but you've got a new book coming out in 2021, right? Bone Canyon comes out. Yes, in yes, I do. And you have a new Gangsterland book, right? Gangster yeah. Story. So my new book, The Low Desert: Colon Gangster Stories, <laughs> comes out in February. Uh, if the river don't rise and all that, um, and then I'll have another. Gangsterland novel uh, that will either be the last book or one of 15 if the show that Amazon optioned 
gets on the screen. <laughs> if, the, if, if I have a TV show on, you're going to be reading about that rabbi's problems for a really long time. Yeah, the TV will have a big impact on whether there's more Ian Ludlow's and more Lost to Bill <laughs> Ronan books as well. Although I, I can't reveal the, the, the TV deals here and now. Well, well, look, all I have to say is if you have been wondering whether or not a, a dragon could be Jewish, you might find out in <laughs> book nine of the Gangsterland series. Well, hey, thank you, everybody, for coming to the Virtual Thriller Fest. I'm Todd Goldberg. He's Lee Goldberg. Yeah, we'll meet you down in the bar. 